that we didn't talk about today. <clears throat> and there he is uh, sitting on his sailboat on a salt marsh that's in front of our house. Uh, I wanted him to stay on for another uh, six or nine months to finish off two papers uh, before going off to Benke's lab. And so this was my, my attractant here. I said, you could take your sailboat and put it on our salt marsh and go sailing. Of course, eventually winter came and he uh, took his sailboat out and uh, went off to Cambridge. Uh, but in the meanwhile, he did some very important work that I, uh, I'll just briefly mention. I've also mentioned in passing something quite orthogonal to this uh, discussion that is this picture was taken in 2005 and you see a salt marsh here the water has eroded the salt marsh up to this rock and my geologist friends tell me that's because of global warming and the rise in the sea level and so the the salt marsh is eroding very fast but fortunately uh, not at the time when uh, uh, Martin was sitting here <clears throat> okay this one you're not going to be able to see at all this is showing the, how peptide bond formation occurs chemically with an amino acid, attack, the acyte tRNA attacking uh, the peptidyl tRNA uh, and the P site. So that's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> again, with a split uh, ribosome, the acyte tRNA, the P site tRNA, the polypeptide exit tunnel, and it's inside this box where peptide bond formation occurs. That is where the uh, amino acid on the A site tRNA attacks the peptidyl tRNA. And so what Martin Schwing did is look at fragments of the tRNA, the CCA, uh, and ask the question, how do they bind and how are the amino acids arranged? I'll show you a movie which will sh that Martin made that will uh, explain this in more detail uh, momentarily. But what we found, boy, this is worse than, I, I guess it's all these bright lights. <laughs> um, what we found is the CCA is interacting with a part of the ribosome RNA here, and positioning the, the peptidyl, the peptide group, and here's the CCA interacting with the uh, RNA on the ribosome with the amino acid to attack it. And in the end, after many, many structures, what Martin concluded is that at the beginning of this a process of peptide bond formation, the alpha amino group on the amino acid that's attached to the A-site tRNA is positioned to attack the carbonyl carbon of the peptidyl tRNA to form the peptide bond. So the question is, what is the ribosome doing? How is it making this the reaction occur? So the, one of the things it does is orient the substrates. All enzymes work by taking the two substrates and positioning them just right. It's called the entropy factor. It reduces the entropy of the reaction and helps things go faster. What is it doing chemically? Well, we, we saw that this base was there interacting. We thought maybe that's involved. Uh, but um, it was shown uh, that by mutating this, that uh, by other labs, that in fact you can change this to any other base and it doesn't change the reaction. So that's not involved. So the only thing that's left is this 2 prime hydroxyl, which comes from the, the p site substrate, the C76 of the p site substrate. So is that doing anything? <clears throat> but what was done by uh, Scott Strobel's lab at Yale and, and uh, Rachel Green, John Hopkins, is they removed that 2 prime hydroxyl. So what they did is they removed this 2 prime hydroxyl and said, well, what happens? What happens? And what they found is the rate went down 10,000 fold. So clearly, that's very important. And uh, some earlier work, uh, Andrea Barta in uh, Austria uh, concluded, based on her 
studies as well as our early structures that uh, what was happening is that 2 prime hydroxyl is picking up a proton from the attacking alpha amino group, donating it to the leaving group, and what's called a proton shuttle member. That's the detailed uh, chemistry. So how does this thing work? Well, it orients uh, the, the substrates. Uh, it has this uh, proton shuttle. And it's also stabilized in the transition state, which I didn't go into. So, that, so that's how it's working as an enzyme. Well, as, uh, again, uh, as Venke said to you, Francis Crick in 1968, Francis was always thinking ahead, amazing guy. Uh, he said in a, a article in the Journal of Molecular Biology in 1968, <clears throat> maybe I can try and do a British accent, I'm not very good at it. It is tempting to wonder if the primitive ribosome could have been made entirely of RNA. And his rationale was, how could the machine that makes proteins have been a protein before there was a machine to make proteins? It's the chicken and the egg problem. Which came first? <clears throat> and so he hypothesized that, in fact, it was entirely RNA. And of course, as most of the things that Francis said, he was right. So. <clears throat> When we looked, there weren't any proteins closer than 20 angstroms. And in fact, uh, now there are some proteins that are a little closer, uh, but not much. So we concluded that indeed, the ribosome is a ribozyme. OK, so that's how the ribosome works. Now, how do antibiotics work? So now, the rest of my talk, I want to talk about antibiotics, how they work, uh, how mutations uh, and the ribosome affect their function and what you do about it. Oh, no, first, I'm sorry. I forgot Martin's movie. This is essential. So he made many, many, many structures, OK? And, and he put them all together into a movie. And the way you do that is you have lots of pictures, OK? Uh, and, and then you morph it together. And so uh, here's his, his movie. And I'm going to need some sound for this. So I'm going to try maybe putting some sound in here. I don't know if that works. There's the 50S ribosome. And there's the active site. I don't know if the sound is coming out. Now we're coming down to the active site. This is where all the peptide bond formation is going to occur. site substrate. There's the A site substrate coming in. Okay, the A site substrate. Now it turns out there's some induced fit that occurs. Okay, good. We get a little sound here. And the reorient so that this alpha, the alpha amino group is aimed towards the carbonyl carbon here. Okay, now it's about, the alpha amino group's about to attack the carbonyl carbon here. Oh, made it. And there's the tetrahedral intermediate, stabilized by that water molecule. And then it breaks down to give the deacylated product in the P site. Okay, so then this, the isolated substrate will go from the P site. to the E site, the exit site, 
Now this is a little Walt Disney. We don't really know how this process goes in uh, atomic detail, but it wanders from one site to the other. Now it, uh, then the A76 fits in here, and the reason it goes to the E site now is because it can bind here. If it had an amino acid on it, it wouldn't be able to fit in here, okay? Now the last change is the piece, the substrate that's in the A site, that is the now growing peptide, goes from the A site to the P site, and then it's ready to start over again. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry we didn't get all the sound, but uh, <laughs> great movie. Uh, but now the, turning to antibiotics. How do they bind to the TFTS ribosome? What's the mechanism resistance? And how do you design new antibiotics? Again, here, here's some data, a little more detail about the rapid rate in which uh, antibiotic resistance uh, emerges. And usually this happens when, when antibiotics uh, go off patent and they become generic and they get circulated, as, as Venki pointed out, so that you can just go down to the shop and buy it and misuse it. And just look what happens here uh, <coughs> with uh, levofloxacin resistant. This is 50% over a period of, of 10 years. Uh, uh, penicillin resistance, uh, azithromy azithromax, ZPAC, uh, up to 30% over a relatively short time. Uh, this is a new one, linazolid. Uh, it's just starting resistance. It's still on patent, and when it goes off, it'll probably go too. So this is the problem. So how do, how do you uh, solve it? Well, Jeff Hansen uh, uh, did most of the early antibiotic studies. And I'm going to talk about a couple of categories. I'm going to talk about antibiotics that bind uh, uh, that are effective against TB here, and they bind between uh, the two subunits uh, and uh, at the decoding center. And I'm going to talk about uh, ones that bind to where the amino acid in the A site tRNA binds, the side chain binds, uh, they're called A site inhibitors. And then I'm going to talk also uh, about uh, macrolides. Azithromycin, uh, most of you know about uh, azithro erythromycin, most of you know about azithromycin is z pack for some of you who might know about. They find down here. We've looked at many more, but I won't talk about them. So uh, the macrolides, they have a ring that has a number of atoms in them. They're 15 and 16, 14, 15, and 16. Here are the 15 and 16 numbered ones. Uh, they all, the rings are all superimposed. Uh, they, they differ by having different groups hanging out and interacting. That's what makes the antibiotics different. And they're all interacting with RNA. They're not interacting with protein. And so then the question is, well, how do they inhibit? Well, if we, if we again split the ribosome and then look in this area, in red is where the, the macrolide binds, and there's where peptide bond formation is, if we look up the tunnel here, you can see that's where peptide bond formation occurs, and then there's where the antibiotic binds. <clears throat> it's blocking the excess of the polypeptide, the exit of the polypeptide. Uh, I call it molecular constipation, uh, but uh, it, it just prevents the exit. And in green are bases whose mutation give rise to resistance. And you can see what's happening is changing the shape. Well, so what we 